Okay, Larry. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to my town hall meeting. I appreciate you joining me tonight. Uh, just a couple of quick um, uh, notes is that uh, we are adhering to the social distancing rules. So my host, which is Renee Plain, she is at her house right now. I am at my house right now. Um, you may hear some strange sounds uh, of uh, telephones ringing or dogs barking or kids talking. Uh, that's just because we're trying to do it right and, and um, uh, adhere to the uh, social distancing rules. Anyhow, yeah, thank you for joining uh, my town hall meeting. I, uh, I appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to Renee Plain right now, who is the host, and she'll explain a couple of things. Hi, good evening. So as Larry mentioned, my name is Renee Plain. I'm the co-owner of In Plain Sight Marketing and will be moderating tonight's town hall. Um, and because I have three crazy, crazy kiddos at home with me, I've got my video off because they like to make appearances in the most unopportune moments. Um, the purpose of tonight's event is for you to have an opportunity to ask Larry questions and for him to have a chance to connect with you, the residents of uh, Douglas County. Um, well, I'm going to take care of this really quick. There we go. Um, uh, so it's a chance for him to connect with you, the residents of Douglas County, while following the social distancing guidelines that have been set by our nation's and state's leadership. Some general information for tonight. We do have everyone muted for the town hall, um, but we are taking questions through the chat. Um, Larry is planning on holding one of these again each Wednesday at 630 until the week prior to election day, barring any unforeseen circumstances. We are recording tonight's town hall meeting and it will be shared on Larry's website and social channels for those who are unable to attend. So please make sure to share this um, later on down the road with people who were unable to attend. Uh, we have received a few questions via email and direct messages on Facebook, which we will be answering tonight. And then again, as I mentioned, we'll be using that chat box in Zoom to take your questions. We will plan on wrapping this up at the one hour mark. And Larry and I will both be watching the time and plan to end on time because we want to be respectful of your evenings. So when we have five minutes left, we'll wrap up questions and Larry can give his final thought for the evening. Um, so, Larry, with that, um, I think we're ready to jump in. Are you ready? I sure am. Thank you. Perfect. So, um, one of the questions we received prior to this that I think is on everybody's mind is, what are the county's next steps to reopening after the statewide COVID-19 shutdowns? It's a very complicated question. Um, all right, so the, so the COVID-19 um, crisis actually is two separate crises, a healthcare crisis and a, a devastating economic crisis. Um, we have addressed a healthcare crisis by the social distancing rules uh, that we're following um, uh, that are put out by the CDC and by the state. And I, and I really want to thank all the people in Douglas County um, for, um, for basically following those social distancing uh, rules. Uh, we have um, currently three active cases in Douglas County, a total of 22 cases and 19 that have recovered. Um, and you know, they talk about, you hear about on the news, everyone hears on the news that uh, we wanna flatten the curve. Well, 22 cases out of a population of about 50,000 people, we really haven't had a curve. Um, so, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with it here in Douglas County. We have uh, uh, delivered a letter to, uh, to Governor Sisolak last Thursday. Uh, that was a letter that was signed by all five county commissioners. Um, the letter basically stated that uh, we wish additional guidelines be imposed, uh, not additional guidelines, but separate guidelines be imposed uh, on, the, um, on the rural counties of Nevada. Um, like I said, we've only had, we only have three active cases. Story County um, has no active cases, and some of the other counties have low, low active cases right now. Actually, Story County never even had a case. So, um, what our letter requested of the governor is that for the rural counties, which are 15 counties in Nevada, except for uh, Clark County and uh, Washoe, 
you want the rural counties to be treated differently than um, uh, Clark and Washoe counties. Uh, our population uh, is, is actually much, much lower. Uh, and so we feel that uh, we should be treated differently. Now I understand that the governor is uh, supposed to have a conference or a press conference on, uh, on Friday. And uh, he will uh, uh, undoubtedly uh, issue additional uh, statements regarding the COVID-19 crisis. And I hope he addresses the rural counties. I believe he will. Um, we have, um, uh, like I said, we've obeyed and we've adhered to all of the, um, the requirements of the state and the CDC. So uh, we're very hopeful that he will address uh, us separately. Um, the other crisis, of course, that uh, COVID-19 has, um, has addressed is, um, not addressed, but it has caused is, is the, the economic crisis. And that it has a devastating effect, not only on the county, but uh, on, our, on our residents, on our uh, small business owners, our small businesses, some of our large businesses, the casinos. So those, uh, uh, those economic effects are kind of a trickle down thing. It's, it's, uh, if, if people are not able to earn a living, they're not able to pay their taxes, uh, they're not able to go shopping uh, as they normally would. Uh, tax revenues are going to go down, and we really, we really need to address those. And we have started to address those uh, at the county level. Uh, tomorrow, we're having a, a board of county commissioners meeting. Uh, and one of the items on the agenda will address uh, the um, the status of um, the COVID nineteen crisis, and in particular, uh, our budget projections for revenue. We had a. Um, we had a projection, revenue projection that was given to us on May, excuse me, on April 1st or 2nd, I forget the exact date. Um, and that was based on the Department of Taxation, the State Department of Taxation's uh, revenue um, projections at the time. Uh, I understand that the Department of Taxation has not changed those projections, but we feel here in Douglas County that it's gonna be a big impact. Uh, and so we're gonna discuss uh, what projections are we going to go to, uh, with uh, tomorrow at tomorrow's meeting? Um, I think the worst case scenario is that uh, uh, they're projecting that we could have a $10 million shortfall in revenue uh, in the next fiscal year, uh, which is good for fiscal year 2021. Um, the more moderate uh, projections uh, show that we'll have about a $6 million uh, revenue shortfall. And the way we're addressing those is that. Uh, uh, Number one, first of all, in, in, the, in the current fiscal year, which is fiscal year 20, ending on June 30th, 2020, um, I don't believe there's going to be, we don't believe there's going to be any, um, any shortfall of revenue. In fact, uh, through the third quarter, the revenue uh, received, um, for instance, on the uh, TOT and the transit occupancy tax, um, that has a, that's been uh, $2 million over what we originally projected for revenue. Uh, some of our general fund revenue was also uh, increased over what we were originally projected. So um, we may have a um, uh, revenue, uh, excess revenue uh, at the end of fiscal 20, uh, perhaps as much as $4 million. Uh, and of course, we will use that to address issues that will uh, impact the, the next fiscal year. Um, another way we're addressing the um, the budget is that uh, our county manager has um, instituted a hiring freeze uh, on all new employees right now. He's also instituted um, or directed the departments of the county to um, cut their uh, purchasing by at least 10% over what was budgeted uh, uh, initially in the tentative budget. Uh, there'll be other places where we can, we can actually cut uh, and move revenues around, but that's going to be decided at a budget meeting probably sometime uh, mid-month this month. Uh, we have to submit a final budget, which has to be balanced um, with the Department of Taxation. And um, I forget the deadline for that, but uh, it's coming up soon. So we're going to have some serious decisions to make. Uh, but I do want to, uh, again, um, thank the, the residents of Douglas County for adhering to the social distancing and hopefully with that, the, the, um, 
the governor can um, can see uh, some leeway in, in allowing us to open up businesses and resume uh, some kind of normalcy here in, in, in Douglas County. Um, no, at the, at the debate, I don't know how many of you watched the debate the other night, but it was really well attended. I understand uh, there were some 14 or 15,000 people that were watching it uh, online. Uh, and my, my opponent, um, he stated that the uh, BOCC, the Board of County Commissioners, must focus on the needs of the county and not the wants. Well, if it's one thing he's, he should have learned by attending the BOCC meetings in the past is that he should have learned that that's exactly what we do. We base our, we have a, a, a priority-based budgeting. It's kind of a hybrid system by priority-based and zero-based. So we do base our, our, um, our needs and our budget on the needs of the uh, needs of the county and not on pet projects like some of them are And one last thing uh, about revenue. Um, uh, there will be an initiative, I believe, it hasn't been approved by the board yet, but it will be an initiative um, uh, on the November ballot asking for uh, a tax increase on diesel fuel. Um, uh, I know we have a tax adverse county that doesn't like to raise taxes, but perhaps the initiative um, might see some light if the residents realize that people driving uh, gasoline cars are paying five cents for a gallon, then uh, many people are driving the diesel tax, and that extra tax revenue can go a long way towards towards road maintenance or perhaps uh, um, for a bond that we may issue for new new roads or something. So, anyhow, that's that's basically uh, what I have to say about COVID nineteen. Uh, on Friday, uh, we are having a joint meeting of the Board of Health and the Board of County Commissioners uh, to discuss uh, reopening Douglas County. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some more guidance by from the state by then. Uh, but please join in. We'll have, uh, like I said, the Board of Health, which is made up of the county, uh, uh, the county commission plus uh, the sheriff and uh, the um, health officer, which is um, uh, Dr. Holman. So I'm sure we'll we'll have some really good dialogue on, on Friday and talk about how we can open up. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, before we go into the next question that actually came in from chat, I do want to let everybody know we are aware that it sounds like there's a, a sound feedback issue. It's unfortunately it's the fan in Larry's computer. So please bear with us. We're sorry for the sound. We are working on some other options for next week. Um, so um, for the next question that came from the queue, uh, who is the libertarian running for this district at the general election? I don't know the man personally. He, I believe he lives in Ruinstrop, which is the neighborhood that I live in. But I have no idea uh, uh, what his um, platform is all about. I do uh, plan to reach out to him uh, after the primary and talk to him and, uh, and uh, see if we can work together on running a clean campaign. But I do not know him personally. Uh, the next question that also came from the chat is, first, thank you, Larry, for your service. And what is the status of the VA clinic in Gardnerville? The VA clinic, I believe, is, is open, uh, still open. Um, but they are taken only by appointments. You can only visit them by appointments. Um, I haven't personally been to the clinic. Uh, this year, so I don't know exactly what's going on, uh, but uh, uh, I'm hoping that it's uh, still up and running and that uh, uh, we can continue to serve the vets here in Douglas County. Um, Larry, I know that during Monday's town hall debate, um, the time frame for the questions are, are short um, because there's a lot to get through, um, but I know that you had wanted to expand a little bit more on your thoughts on RDA2, and a question did come in via email about that, about explaining the advantages of RDA2 project as it seems to be a positive addition to the economy, but the people opposed to it say it will ca cost the taxpayer money. Oh my goodness, cost the taxpayer money. Can you elaborate? I can, and, 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 and yes, the, the, the time to answer uh, during the debate was uh, one minute and uh, 
And that's a 15 or 20 minute conversation with somebody. I hope we don't take that long tonight, but I have had some conversations with people uh, that have lasted even up to a half an hour explaining the benefits of RDA2. Uh, and uh, they finally understood it. Uh, and they like, they like hearing the facts. So um, what I'd like to do is, is, is first of all, um, during the debate, I believe it was Commissioner Nelson who, 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 who um, thinks that uh, RDA1, which was in, up in North County, which gave us the, uh, uh, the Walmart Center, the Best Buy Center, and Home Depot and Target, um, that redevelopment area he thought was uh, not successful. I can tell you, um, I don't understand his logic because the, the taxable sales in RDA 1 um, uh, were increased by some $500 million annually. And that's, that's probably an increase of sales tax of $32 million annually, which Douglas County gets a good portion of. So uh, I think RDA 1 was very successful. Uh, we had uh, uh, benefits that were not only um, actually in the RDA district, but we had benefits that went as far as Genoa. Uh, uh, we, um, we, we were able to complete the, the uh, or not, still in the process of completing the, uh, uh, the sewer, uh, the water loop, excuse me, the uh, water loop that, that really uh, creates a lot of redundancy here in Douglas County from our uh, Douglas County utility. So there are a lot of benefits that were, and at the end there was, um, some three or four million dollars that were um, that was uh, remaining in the RDA and under NRS those monies must be used in the RDA district and fortunately uh, the town of Genoa was included uh, in the RDA district so we were able to allocate well over a million dollars uh, to the town for um, refurbishing their their town hall uh, and some other improvements in the town and of course, Genoa is very, very important uh, to Douglas County because of their, um, uh, their tourism uh, that comes from that town to visit uh, the wonderful things that are there. So we were able to do that. We were able to also uh, set aside, um, I think, $2.1 million to complete, I um, uh, can't think of the name of the road now, um, uh, that goes from Indian Hills up to, uh, uh, to Douglas, uh, to uh, Costco. So that will be completed and that will provide us an uh, emergency exit uh, for people coming north uh, that are, say, clogged on the, say, the Highway 395 is probably now on the second, will now have a secondary exit. But let me get back to RDA 2. Um, first of all, there's a little history here. I mean, we have, that, that dates back to 1997 when the, when the state of Nevada uh, created the enabling edge of, edge of, edge of legislation that um, created the Tahoe Douglas Visitors Authority. The state recognized back in 1997 that state line um, and the tax revenue being uh, generated state line and the visitation um, being uh, generated a state line, by state line, uh, had declined. Uh, the revenue uh, uh, declined uh, even way back then, and so that the, the uh, legislation enabled the, the TDBA, the Tahoe Douglas Business Authority, to be created, and, it, and, the, and the legislation also created a um, one cent, I believe it is, TO, uh, TOT, the Transit Occupancy Tax, which funds the operation of TDBA, TDBA which and their main their main function was to promote tourism in Lake Tahoe. And specifically in the state line. So that's where it dates back to 1997. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we've seen it develop over those years. When I was uh, running for county commission back in 2016, I supported the RDA to open Lake Tahoe with the state line because I recognized back then uh, that the county was losing over a million dollars a year in tax revenue, property tax revenue because the casino assessed values were declining. I didn't know very much about the event center back in 2016. So I wanted to definitely learn more about it, what its function would be and how it would impact um, 
Douglas County. So, and of course, you know, some people may not be aware of this, but 32% of the workforce in Douglas County is connected to the tourism industry. 32%, one third of our industry is, is related to tourism. So we have a big stake in making sure that the, um, um, the casino corridor um, is uh, successful, vi vibrant, and, and uh, contributing to our economy. Uh, uh, they were contributing, I think maybe it's still about the same, 39, 40% of our general fund property tax revenue. Uh, and we needed to protect that. And when I learned about the event center and what it might do, uh, it, it was going to be uh, owned and operated by the by the TDVA, uh, and uh, they work in the construction construct it, excuse me. Um, but I knew that they wanted to have Douglas County participate somehow. And what they uh, what they wound up doing is uh, um, asking the county to uh, dedicate. Um, monies to help them pay off the bond that would be used to construct um, the event center. But the event center itself uh, would uh, hold some 130 events a year, whether they were concerts, or conventions, meetings, what have you. And what that does is it, what they call up in, in, the, in, the, in the hotel business, it puts heads in beds and people come to an event uh, they stay in hotels. They spend their money here, uh, and it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing um, uh, to have that kind of impact on our uh, hospitality business. Uh, you know, Lake Tahoe um, is is one of the top ten destination uh, resort areas in the world. And I know there was a comment at the debate that, that stated uh, that the, the the Reno Event Center uh, only produce say 30% of what it was originally supposed to produce. Well, that's Reno and it's not Lake Tahoe, ladies and gentlemen. And I, I believe that people from Austria or Europe or wherever, uh, uh, if they have an opportunity to hold a conference or come to a meeting uh, in the United States, I think Lake Tahoe stands a very, very good chance. So um, uh, the, the event center, um, cost is approximately $100 million. And the TDVA is going to float a bond uh, for that construction and operate, initial operation. Of that. And they've asked the county to uh, um, dedicate, um, uh, you'll hear this number a lot, $34.25 million of the RDA tax increment. I'll explain that in a minute. They, they, they've uh, asked us to, to dedicate that 34.25 million over a 25 year period so that um, that would go to pay off part of the, um, uh, the cost of the event center. It represents about 19% of the total cost of the event center. Um, what my opponents and some people fail to realize is that um, the, uh, the 34.25 million, which is taking money out of the general fund. Some of, this, some of that is going to the general fund normally or the schools or the fire department. What they don't, what they fail to realize is that over that same 25 million, excuse me, 25 year uh, period, uh, the, the event center itself will generate about $1.6 million um, a year in additional sales and TOT tax revenue. That equates to a net gain to the county's coffers of six to seven billion dollars over the next 25 years after you deduct the 34.25 million. So it's a win situation for the county, but uh, because the the opposition uh, only uh, uh, thinks in, in, in small increments and, and doesn't look at the big picture, uh, they conveniently uh, forget that particular um, aspect of the event center. Um, hey, Larry. Yes. There was a, a couple of questions on RDA2 that came in. Um, one of them, I think, is um, what impact on the county is there by, by losing the additional TOT money? What is it now and in the future? And, and how, um, how is it 
how is this going to um, help in the future, which I know you're kind of digging into that question, but. Well, um, are you talking to the loss in DOT from the COVID-19 crisis? Because I, I, I thought I covered that. Well, I think what, what a lot of people um, seem to think is that all the taxpayers in Douglas County are paying for this event center out of the 34.25 million. That's the furthest thing from the truth. The, 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 the reality is that the only people are paying into the RDA um, district uh, with their property taxes are the people and the, the businesses in the RDA district at state line. Those are the only people and that district consists of the Casino Corridor, uh, Edgewood, and the Tahoe Beach Club. The only only entities that are in that that district. There's not going to be one dime taken from the taxpayers that reside in uh, the Carson Valley to be used to pay for the event center. It's very important to understand that. Uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to drive a wedge. The opposition is trying to drive a wedge between the Tahoe Township and the residents of the valley, and we can't let that happen. Uh, you know, the Tahoe Township has tried once before to um, secede from the county and start their own county. If that were to happen again, where will we, where will we ever get 40 or 45 percent of revenue from that the state line currently uh, produces for the, for the county? So uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I, you know, it's it's the loss of revenue that they talked about yesterday at the um, debate board on Monday. There was a follow-up question um, from the original asker of how does it affect um, both of the chambers, both the lake and the valley, and more importantly, the parks and rec department? The, uh, the TOT tax um, funds a lot of, of um, community services, both down here in the valley and up at the lake. Uh, for example, it, it funds the operation of the um, uh, community services, which includes the community center, the health nurse, um, a lot of other services, the DART service uh, down here in the valley. And up at the lake, it funds uh, uh, tourism uh, projects, it funds the Kale Community Center up at the lake. So um, we're gonna have to find alternatives to keep those uh, types of business, uh, those uh, services uh, available to the, to the residents. But, Definitely the TLT tax has a big impact on the community services. And we'll address that during the budget for the um, and, and just to make sure, I think you addressed this, but just in case there's anything you want to add to this question um, that also came in through chat is um, discussing the arguments by those who don't want the event center and why those arguments don't make sense. I, I feel like you, you answered that, but I just want to make sure if you have anything else that you want to add to that question. Okay, I, I just have to ask you to, to repeat that again because my, uh, my computer is uh, kind of acting up and the noise coming from my computer kind of drowned it out of the question. Sorry. <laughs> um, so can you discuss the arguments by those who don't want the event center and why those arguments don't make sense? Well, I, I, yeah, I think I've answered most of that. The, the, uh, those who are opposed to the event center, they're opposed because they think that the casinos are getting a, a free ride. Uh, not so. It's up to the county to try to stabilize the income at, at state line. And one of the ways we do that is to uh, help increase the uh, assessed value of those properties up there, uh, mainly the casino. The casinos are, are the, the assessment to the casinos or their assessed value is based on their income from rooms. So the more, the, the, the more uh, uh, ways that we can help the casinos fill those heads and beds, and the event center certainly is a big one, uh, the higher their, their uh, revenue is and the higher their assessed value is and the higher the tax revenue coming from Douglas County. So um, I think, uh, uh, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the conversation has been that you know, the casinos, they should invest in their own properties. Well, I can tell you over the last one or two or three years, uh, the casinos have invested a couple of hundred million dollars in the property, and, and uh, uh, 
we doing uh, rooms and, and uh, uh, open space, you know, the, the, the meeting rooms and, and what they have in there and, and the casino areas. Um, but that doesn't impact the assessed value because the assessed value, like I just said, is based on the number of heads and beds in the, in the uh, casino revenue that's being received. Uh, so uh, even though they've made some great investments, uh, that again does not uh, increase the assessed value. I mean, the, the Edgewood Lodge was built by Edgewood companies at a cost of $160 million. Again, that's a property where their um, uh, assessed value is based on, um, on heads and beds. And so uh, uh, they're looking forward to the events of how it will impact uh, uh, their revenue. And, and, uh, and the Tahoe Beach Club, which will invest almost $400 million in their project, uh, I think the first phase is done now. Uh, the people buying those um, those units, those individual funding units, they certainly want to come, come to Tahoe and they, they, a lot of it is outdoor recreation, but they all also want to see events and concerts, so it will impact them too. We're going to switch to a completely different topic now. Um, so this one came in through chat and it is Topaz Ranch Estates has only has one viable well. We have a GID, but if the well fails at any point, would Douglas County step in? Are we required under NRS uh, to step in? I mean, it's happened in a couple of places that happens with, uh, I think, the Church Peak and the Sierra, uh, the Sierra Country Estates and, um, and the Sheridan Acres. And those systems, those individual systems failed. And, and the county was required to step in and it, took, it cost us millions of dollars to improve them. And they're now part of the Douglas County utility. Uh, down in Topaz, down in TRE, they have their own general improvement district, which uh, 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 takes care of their, their water and their streets. So uh, if their um, uh, systems fail, um, and I'm sure that their GID is, is um, um, monitoring those systems, I don't know that much about them, but uh, I'm sure they're monitoring the, the systems. Uh, but if it should fail at some point in time, it is the county obligation under NRS to take over that system and it's not going to be cheap. Um, I think that leads into perfectly a question that we received um, via email as well, which is where do you stand on GIDs and continuing them? Well, there was recent legislation um, sponsored by, I believe, Assemblyman Wheeler or Senator Settlement uh, that uh, allowed the counties to actually uh, look into GIDs if we thought that there was anything uh, suspicious or anything going on that, that might require uh, looking into the GIDs. And so we have that right to do that. I think the GIDs provide a valuable service. Uh, look at the town of Minden or the town of Gardner. They take care of roads, uh, sewer and water, um, garbage pickup, uh, all those services uh, uh, that are uh, combined into their tax rate, where the cost of those services are paid for by a higher tax rate than we like in real estate thing because we're in the rural area and not, not part of the GID. But the GIDs, I think, provide a very valuable uh, service. They're the closest to the people, uh, the ranchos, the Gardner Hill Ranchos GID. Uh, they know what the people in the ranchos need and want. And they take care of their roads. I, I've heard that uh, some people uh, believe that the water system and the ranchos need some attention. I did talk to uh, uh, Greg Reed, who's the uh, director of the, um, uh, the, the manager of the Bernardo uh, uh, Ranchers General Improvement District. Uh, he felt that they were on top of it. They're monitoring it, so they're looking at it closely. I believe him. Uh, I've had meetings with uh, John Lebrano up in Indian Hills, and they're doing the same. I've had meetings with uh, Eric Nielsen, who's the uh, County Gardnerville manager and with uh, J.D. Frisbee is the Minden manager and they do a very good job of, of managing um, uh, the GIDs and the, the water system. So uh, right now I'm happy to report that I don't think there's any issues 
uh, in the Douglas County Water Utility, we were able to consolidate many of the older, uh, smaller systems in the one county utility, including Lake Tahoe, a lot of the um, water purveyors up in Lake Tahoe. So we were able to stabilize rates this past year, stabilize base rates. Um, so anything over your base rate is based on usage, uh, which is the way it should be. Um, and of course, I think the, the, um, the state, not the state line, but the Tahoe Township uh, uh, GIDs up there, the, the Jet uh, Separate Boat and, and, and um, Cave Rock and those, uh, they have a, um, um, what they call it, but it's an extra uh, fee that they pay to cover uh, existing um, issues uh, with their systems. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to, to tell you that uh, we're now at the bid and we may have even accepted the bids for the Cave Rock improvement to, to their water system. Uh, well, those systems over the lake get their, uh, their water out of the Lake Tahoe. And some of those uh, systems were built back in the 40s and 50s, haven't been replaced since. So um, because we did consolidate water, um, water districts and, and uh, now have that one county utility, uh, we were able to um, um, do the power of, of, of uh, everybody gets together, uh, the power of many. Uh, we were able to um, uh, bond uh, for some of those uh, projects up at Lake Tahoe uh, and, uh, and get those taken care of. And it's very, very important, for instance, that we have a good water system in Cave Rock and in, in uh, Zephyr Cove uh, in order to protect against wildfires. So that's being done. Okay, I rambled on. I'm not sure I answered your question. Um, so this next one came in uh, via email. Um, there seems to be a lot of misinformation about the Muller Parkway bypass, how commissioners voted on it, and if 2,500 homes have been approved. Can you elaborate? You know, the, the, uh, I think you have to combine the, the Muller Parkway with the uh, park receiving area that, uh, uh, and uh, the development agreement with park uh, ranch holdings. I have to combine those two with, with actually with growth. Uh, so um, uh, I think um, I'd like to address it in, in, in that manner. Um, first of all, the park, uh, park cattle company, now Park Ranch Holdings, um, had an existing agreement with Douglas County to provide uh, the right of way for Muller Parkway through their property, their Buckeye Road holdings. Um, and and um, that agreement, like I said, dates back to 2004. And it's very important to understand that that agreement with the county says, okay, county, here's the, the, here's the right of way for Muller Parkway through our property and we want no development rights, none. I'm gonna say that again. The original agreement with Park Ranch, Park Ranch Holdings, and we're gonna give us the right of way from Muller Parkway through their property and ask for no development rights. In late 2018, uh, the county and park wanted to make some changes uh, to the development agreement, which included extending uh, dates for uh, certain uh, thresholds that uh, either party had to meet. And also, I think they wanted to change the alignment uh, of Muller Parkway to their property to the benefit actually of the county. Um, and in 2018, when that uh, development agreement, uh, when the amendment to that development agreement, to the existing development agreement, came before the county commission, there was a lot of discussion, a healthy discussion. And uh, the county was, uh, the, the BOCC, the board was, was deadlocked at 2-2 um, uh, and uh, the deciding vote to approve that development agreement uh, laid in the hands of uh, Commissioner Dave Nelson and he voted no uh, to that uh, amendment to the development agreement. So I really want to thank Mr. Nelson for the 2,500 homes that we have now. Um, I'm not sure why he, he voted the way he did. Uh, but so now we have a new development agreement with Park Cattle or Park Ranch Holdings. And when Park came 
uh, back to the county. Uh, they said, okay, if you want that right away, now we want something. And they wanted some development rights in return for uh, granting the right away to Model Parkway. But they also proposed a lot of other benefits to the county. They were willing to give us not only the 105 foot right of way for the Model Parkway, the four lanes of Model Parkway, but an additional 100 foot right of way between the Muller Parkway and the Virginia Ditch to the east. And that, that, right, of, that right of way for the new uh, uh, 100, 100 foot right of way would um, be used for uh, drainage easements. We have big uh, drainage problems out in, in the Pine Nut Mountains. Um, one is the Buckeye Wash uh, coming down from the Pine Nuts, uh, and uh, the other is the Pine Nut Wash. And um, they, they cause a lot of issues. Uh, primarily during the uh, uh, during the summer months, when we have uh, uh, some um, big thunderstorms, and I've seen uh, I've seen water uh, flow over Buckeye Road north of Buckeye. Uh, excuse me, but I've seen water flow over East Valley River, just north of Buckeye Road. Back in I remember it was 1993, 1992, we had a horrendous um, uh, thunderstorm. And a neighbor called me up and he says, "You got to come see this." And there was water five feet deep flowing over East Valley Road for about 150, 200 yard uh, width. That's a lot of water. So this this um, um, additional right of way for the for the drainage improvements that Mr. Park offered uh, is certainly going to help with uh, issues on the Buckeye Wash and on the Pine Nut Wash, so that we contain we can contain those um, uh, those flood waters. And will also that will help because it'll take a number of people out of the um, uh, floodplains, and that will uh, that will help the uh, some of the residents in in Winhaven and Gardnerville uh, not having to have to pay this uh, flood insurance. Um, another benefit uh, um, was that Park offered us a uh, easement, a construction easement, to put a new culvert under Highway 88. Uh, and uh, he offered that in a development agreement to um, uh, let us use his property for the construction of these um, these new culverts. And the culverts, we got a million and a half, it was a million and a half dollar um, grant from, from NDOT, the uh, United uh, Department of Transportation. But that grant was going to expire if we didn't do something. So Mr. Grant, Mr. Grant, Mr. Park, um, offered us uh, an easement so we can construct those culverts, and that again will take people out of, out of the flood zone because it's it's really irrigation water water there that's the, the biggest problem, uh, but it will take a lot of people out of uh, out of the flood zone or in back lane hopefully. Um, another benefit to the park development agreement, uh, uh, Mr. Park uh, or Park Ranch Holdings owns what they call the Clobber Ranch, and they want to develop that Clobber Ranch. Which is just north of Westwood, between Westwood and uh, Muller, uh, Muller Lane, um, and they've offered to uh, and, uh, it's in the development agreement, the signed development agreement. They've offered to strip all the development rights off of Clobber uh, and transfer those development rights to their new receiving area that they have up on uh, Buckeye Road. They've also offered a, a um, I believe it's about a mile and a half, mile and three quarter easement along uh, the Park Ranch Holdings on Muller Lane, on the south portion of Muller Lane. It's outside of Muller Lane. Uh, and that's about, um, like I said, about a mile and three quarters. They're going to give us a, a 10 foot, or, no, 20 foot wide easement, I believe, uh, for trails. And that eventually could, could connect the town of Minden uh, all the way to the um, um, Conservancy ranch out on, uh, on between uh, Muller and uh, Genoa Lane. So that was, a, that was a big give by Clark. And he also um, offered, we didn't have a completion on the right of way uh, from his land um, uh, that terminated just north of uh, Toller Road, uh, Toller Lane, uh, I think about half a mile. So he, got, he gave us that right of way as, as well. So um, uh, it's important to understand all the ramifications of the development agreement. Um, the county did, uh, after we negotiated the development agreement, we did provide a receiving area to Mr. Park. And normally in a receiving area, you're allowed to have 16 units per acre at density. 
uh, Mr. Park agreed to limit any residential uh, development in that new receiving area, which is approximately a thousand acres, um, he offered to um, limit the development in that um, in that receiving area to 2,500 homes. Of course, nothing's been approved, but you'll hear a lot about a lot of comments out there. No on 2,500. Like I explained before, Mr. Nelson is to be thanked for having 2,500 homes possible on uh, uh, on the uh, a receiving area that it has on, on uh, Buckeye Road. But one of the main things about a receiving area is we have other receiving areas in Douglas County. Uh, some are around the ranchos. Um, uh, some is another big receiving area is up in Johnson Lane, which uh, uh, Bentley has turned into uh, uh, into ranching property and they have big pivot fields up there. Uh, and a lot of those fields are being used to raise uh, crops for their uh, Bentley heritage. Uh, distillery. Um, so those those areas, that the Bentley one, I doubt will ever be developed as a receiving area. And certainly the one in the ranchos has a lot of issues with it because in order to develop it, it's on the east side of the ranchos. In order to develop that, uh, we would have to uh, uh, cross the, the Carson River uh, with the new road out to 395. So the, the uh, likelihood of those uh, receiving areas that are currently on the books uh, it is slim that they'll ever get developed. That's why the receiving area for the park is so important because uh, the receiving area is what actually helps us um, preserve open space and ranch land. Uh, the 1996 master plan created the, the, the TDR program, the Transfer Development Right Program, uh, which basically uh, was uh, to compensate the ranches who lost uh, their zoning. Uh, all the ranches in Douglas County, uh, all the ranch lands uh, in Douglas County prior to the master plan being adopted in 1996 had one acre zoning. Well, there's 70,000 acres of approximately 70,000 acres of ranch land on the west side of the valley. Can you imagine having 70,000 one acre parcels there? That was not good. Uh, so when the ranches were stripped of their zoning, they were given what they call 19 acre zoning, so they were allowed one house to 19 acres. Well, we still don't want 19 acre parcels uh, on those 70,000 acres because that would require putting in septic systems and then our uh, septic systems um, uh, are not good for our, uh, the quality of our aquifer. So the TBR program states that um, if a developer who owns a receiving area wants to develop land uh, in that receiving area, he must purchase development rights from a ranch, which are the, the ranch lands are what they call sending areas. And so he must purchase the development rights from uh, those sending areas and transfer them into the receiving area that he's going to develop. And um, one, one house requires um, one development right. And the development right, uh, the, the ranch is right now 19 acres uh, zoning. So uh, they would have the, the right to build one house on 19 acres. So if we strip that off, uh, we'll preserve one house or a good portion of one acre. One 19 acre parcel, um, uh, uh, or a good portion of it, um, to put that into the conservation easement so that they can never build on that. Um, and for example, on, on, on Clark's property, um, I just read the paper last week that he's, uh, uh, he's thinking of proposing, nothing's been proposed yet, but he's thinking about uh, developing his uh, receiving area into an agrohood. An agrohood. Which is a fairly new concept uh, throughout our country, but Europe's been doing it for years. Um, an agrohood basically is a, uh, a development that uh, protects open space and has more dense housing so that the people who live in the agrohood can enjoy the open space, whether it's uh, turned into uh, uh, farms uh, to produce crops, um, whether it remains as ranch land, whether it uh, they have uh, they, they grow other products on it. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And the, and the proposal that was in the paper indicates that uh, uh, the agrohood proposed on the ranch lands for the um, public receiving area uh, would preserve up to half of those lands into open space. That's a, that's a great benefit. And not only that, with, uh, plus that 500 acres, say, 
that we can preserve uh, the receiving area that's on the front branch holdings property must transfer and develop them next. So uh, that's going to project thousands of more uh, acres of ranch land uh, throughout the valley uh, across the area of uh, Douglas County. So uh, I'm very excited about that, but people sometimes don't understand that. Uh, and one of the last important thing is that um, under the master plan, one of the goals um, under the national plan is to um, to place future development in what they call infill areas. On, on the park receiving area is the perfect infill area in Douglas County. It is surrounded, that thousand acres is surrounded by existing multi-family or single-family housing, by commercial properties, existing by existing industrial properties and existing public facilities. Um, they're either existing or the zoning exists to, to build those types of facilities. So it's a perfect infill project. Uh, and, it's, and of course, it's, it's only a quarter mile from the, the largest employer uh, in Douglas County. So uh, I'm very excited about uh, the approval of the receiving area. I'd like to see that develop at some point in the future. Um, Mr. Park or the Park Ranch Holdings uh, is going to have to come before the, um, the town boards, uh, Minden and Gardnerville, and the Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners. So um, um, it'll be uh, it'll be a long process before you think any any homes are actually approved. Does that answer your question? Again, long way. <laughs> that was it. That was a long answer. I think you answered a lot of questions on that. Um, I have so just to keep track of the time, it's seven twenty-two. Um, and we have a couple of other questions that came in from the chat that I want to make sure that we get to. Um, so I would like you to uh, just be aware of time for these questions as you're answering. Um, so should there be a road task, road tax for county roads, Johnson Lane, et cetera? Well, um, uh, like I, I alluded to a little bit before, uh, the people in the in the GIDs and the towns, uh, uh, they they pay more taxes than I do in Rumenstraw or the people in Johnson Lane because we are in the rural part of Douglas County, and they've been uh, the GIDs and towns have been collecting uh, almost one third more property taxes than like we pay. Um, I think the, the tax rate in the GIDs is three dollars and sixty six cents per hundred. My tax rate in Rumenstraw. Is two dollars and eighty-seven cents per uh, hundred of assessed value. So, um, so the, the GIDs and the towns they have good roads because part of that extra assessment that they pay goes to maintain their roads. Whereas the people in the rural areas they have to depend on on, um, uh, on the general fund monies that are available, um, or the or the road maintenance, the road operating fund that's available, paid and that's paid to by gasoline taxes um, to fix their local roads. I, I sponsored an ordinance that was passed last year that allows, that, that mandates all new roads in rural areas must apply to the Board of County Commissioners to be annexed into a new GID, and that GID will collect taxes for their residents um, to pay for the maintenance of those roads in perpetuity. There's also a provision in there that existing GIDs could, um, once they bring their roads up to the standard that uh, the county wants, they could also tax themselves. Um, to pay for their road maintenance. Is that short enough? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, okay, and then I've got two more questions for tonight. Um, so this one is Topaz Ranch Estates has received federal grants from the government to upgrade the water lines. There have been multiple leaks and the GID has had to repair. The GID says they they have no recourse against the contractor and zero money to complete repairs. When would the county step in? I mean, uh, we, we haven't been approached by the GID down there. Uh, the county, again, like I said before, can certainly uh, take a look at the GID, could have our um, uh, external uh, aud uh, internal auditors uh, take a look at them and, and, uh, and their books and see uh, what their needs are. Um, but we haven't been approached by them, so I can't really answer uh, that question until right now. Until we're approached, uh, uh, there's nothing the county can do. Okay, and then um, we've got five minutes left, so I have time for this final question that came in via chat. 
Um, and I, there are a couple of more, and I do want you to know that I see your questions and we have everyone's contact information. Um, so I will make sure that Larry gets in touch with you with answers to these questions and then um, uh, we can also put those answers on social for you. Um, so the final question for tonight is how should we fund the, oh my goodness, how should we fund the, the Judicial Law and Enforcement Center? Well, we've seen um, reports from the, the Justice uh, uh, over in over in the in the JLEC building, uh, and they they've done some in-depth studies, uh, and there's no doubt that they um, uh, they are cramped for space over there. Even after we moved the civil division of the district attorneys over to uh, across the street, um, still the DA is is cramped there, um, and, and the, uh, the sheriff could probably use some additional space, and definitely the district courts need some uh, space to. Uh, segregate um, those being prosecuted versus uh, those who are prosecuted. Um, the way to fund those things, and that, that, that estimate that we received was some $30 million. That's a lot of money. That, that's equal to uh, three-fifths of our general fund money. So um, one of the ways we could fund it is, is through a, um, a bond. But uh, when I signed the tax pledge, I said that uh, uh, the bonds need to go or any tax increases need to go um, uh, to the public for a vote. So, um, you know, one of the ways we could do that is, is, is to ask the residents if they want to pay an additional tax, whether that's sales tax or, or whatever, um, uh, to, to pay for that. Uh, there's no question that um, with the social and uh, changes in economic changes that we've gone through over the last 30 plus years since that building was originally built. It probably is outused, it's outlived its, its usefulness as far as the size is concerned. So it's a, it's a serious concern, but I think the, the way to do that would be to uh, um, ask the folks if they want to um, uh, load a bond and, and, and provide some kind of revenue stream to pay off that bond. Okay, you have about one minute for any final wrap-up comments that you would like to give. Thank you, um, and I appreciate everybody joining in tonight. Um, it was great to, to be with you. Certainly wonderful uh, to be on the debate the other night. Um, I, I think you know, Douglas County is at, at a crossroads. There are some people who, who want to hijack the county commission, uh, people moving in from California. I don't, I don't mean to degrade anybody moving in from California, but some of them are very big elitists. They, 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 they have their piece of heaven that they bought here in Douglas County, uh, and they want to close the door behind them. And I don't think we could do that. Uh, I think we need moderate growth. Uh, and so they have, um, uh, got a campaign that's uh, against me. Um, and I believe it's caused basically by, or, or it's actually um, uh, funded by these uh, people, these elitists from California, and they want to impose their, their way of life on little old Douglas County. I don't think so. So uh, I, I, let me just leave you with this thought. Uh, I have the experience uh, to be, uh, for the job of Douglas County Commissioner. Uh, I have the experience as a Douglas County Commissioner. Um, I think coming out of this, the COVID-19 crisis is very important that we have a, a decisive, steady leadership at the policy level and then that person uh, to lead the way and uh, be proud to do it and certainly ask for your, um, uh, your support uh, and for your vote uh, uh, in the June primary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for showing up and participating. Um, we did record tonight's town hall, so it's going to be posted on Larry's website, uh, www.walsh4dc, that's four spelled out, not the number, um, as well as his social channels. And we look forward to doing this again next week, um, hopefully with a better microphone so we don't hear the fan. Um, and we'll be scheduling these out. So please share with any of your uh, family and friends who would be interested in this type of Q&A town hall with Larry. Thanks so much.
Thank you all. Good night.